Okay, I'm here with the fantastic author, international master, Cirrus Lakdawalla. Cirrus has written many chess books. Uh, how many, actually, have you written? I couldn't find an exact uh, count. It's 61. My name, by the way, is pronounced Cyrus. Oh, I'm but, sorry. I'm uh, sorry, Cyrus. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's, it's 61. 61. 61. Yeah, I've got two coming out um, with Karsten Hansen in probably the next few weeks, this month at least, sometime, so. Fantastic. Um, how do you find time to write so many books? Um, it, you find the time when it's fun, you know? If, if it's not a job, if you don't consider it a job, and uh, you kind of see yourself as like a con artist because people are paying <laughs> you to do stuff that you think is fun and you do like maybe for free, right? <laughs> you know, but they're actually yeah. paying you and you go, what? You know, they're paying me to do this, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And what got you into writing chess books? Um, I, I actually was, um, I was a writing and literature major in college. And I, I actually wrote a syndicated column, a uh, chess column for Copley News Service um, pretty much all through the 80s, and it stopped in, like, 1992. Like I, it, Not all through the 80s. I would say from 84 to 1992. Uh, they, this is a newspaper or a magazine? Yeah, this was, a, like, a, it was for the San Diego uh, Union Tribune, but... It, it got syndicated, uh, and it was in 300 newspapers. Wow, that's um, fantastic! Yeah, I I quit when they uh, they tried to like uh, blackmail me, you know, like at the end where, like, you, you know, the the un the San Diego uh, Union and the San Diego Tribune merged in the early 90s. Uh, it, it was the point where the internet was starting to come out and yeah. the, the newspapers were all kind of getting into trouble. <laughs> so they we're doing this extortion scheme where um, they uh, they got rid of about, um, they merged the two papers, but they cut about 40% of the people. And for the 60 that they wanted, and I was one of the ones they wanted to keep, um, they wanted us all to take a pay cut, you know, like, mm -hmm. they, and I said, no, you're making a ton of money on my column. I'm not taking a pay cut, you know, sorry. Right. So I, I'm the only uh, person in the history of the world to give up a syndicated column, but I, I didn't like the extortion part of it, so I, I stopped doing it. And then I didn't write for a long, long time, except for, you know, like San Diego chess club newsletter articles and stuff and maybe a little bit for rank and file just you know a little article here and there right chess rank and file is uh the Sa southern california chess federation's magazine right. that they they right. produce I wrote since a column the 90s with jack yeah uh, peters for a while there but when, when was it 2008 uh every man offered me a book on the london uh <laughs> the London system, because I'm like the London guy, you know. I mean, like I, like when Ding uh, played the London on, on <laughs> Nepo, I, I started singing "You Are My Sunshine, My Only Sunshine." <laughs> I don't know why, I just I burst into song, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You 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 uh you went all over the socials when that happened because uh, because yeah, it, it was you are known my, as the London my whole guy. Life like came to that day, you know. Like, <laughs> all the all the hate crimes, the the London hate crimes. You know, like people love to make anti-London memes, right? Right. I, I, right. Which I consider, of course, hate crimes. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay, so let's 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 de de delve into that real quick. So the London sure. system is a chess opening for anybody right. that's uninitiated. That that was considered um, boring or not even playable at the top level for a long time, right? It, it was considered essentially like a cure for insomnia, you know, I mean, it's like a <laughs> complete, uh, you know, uh, in my, in the London book, I called it, I, you know, if I, I'm probably mis misquoting myself, but I, I called it, you know, an opening for the, uh, 
the dull and the talentless, the dull, <laughs> the cowardly, and the talentless, something like that, which, <laughs> which is really true. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true, you know? Yeah. It's like if you, um, if you have talent, you want to play like a Nadorf, and, you know, you want to just complicate, because you can do all these calculations and deep, deep calculations like i if you if you have no talent uh the the path to supremacy is to suppress your opponent's talent uh -huh. by 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 draining the position of, of joy you <laughs> see <And> so, <laughs> okay so then why would it why would a chess player want to do that at all well okay like for, for example i i played kasparov three blitz games in 1998 okay yeah um Kasparov at age 17 had been a grandmaster for a long time, okay, and was clearly headed for world championship, right? At 17, I'm, I'm 1795 rated, okay, so there's a little bit of a talent differential there, right? <laughs> but I broke even with Kasparov. I went one and a half, one and a half. I was the only, besides me, Tony Miles was the only player that day on IC, on the old ICC to do that. Uh -huh. and. Tony did it just by being gifted, and you know he won one, and Kasparov won one. But I I scored a draw and a win, uh, basically by draining all the life out of the position, like you know, like completely. Uh, <laughs> like there's, I'm sorry, I know you can out -cal calculate me by you know like uh, exponentially, but there are no tactics. I've removed every every. <laughs> A bit of joy from the position, and so now you're just ordinary. You know? <laughs> Wait, was this before Kramnik uh, invented or yes. not adopted the uh, Berlin defense? The Berlin Wall. Yeah. And you know, Kramnik was not better than Kasparov when he won the yeah. World Championship. It's he won it because Kasparov won was a bit stubborn to to keep playing e4 and lopez he could have played a scotch he could have played d4 right and i'm sure he would have, i'm pretty sure he would have won the match you know right but he he it, it like hurt his pride that kramnik had neutralized his roy lopez right and he kept going <laughs> right into kramnik's prep you know like the the, the deepest possible preparation in, in the history of the human race at that time yeah you know? Yeah, and I think that's why he lost. The, he lost the match because of a bad psychological decision, not from being the weaker player. Right. I, I think he was at least as strong as Kramnik when he lost the title. Yeah. You know. I think that's pretty universally accepted. Um, let's get back to your writing, though. Um, you said what you said about the the London system itself is kind of. A re I, I see it as representative of your style. You you. You add in all these really interesting and colorful um, anecdotes and and connecting it to other areas of of life in mm -hmm. a way that a lot of chess authors don't do. Um, mm -hmm. Is this a, a natural thing for you, or did you take time to develop that? Um, no, it's just because I'm a wannabe novelist. I wanted to be a sci-fi novelist, <laughs> and okay. uh, you know, like I just life didn't allow me to be a sci-fi novelist. I never wrote a sci-fi novel, but that was my dream, you know? Oh, okay. Uh, and then when I got chess book contracts because of, you know, a certain level of, of skill in chess, I thought, I'm not going to let the fact that this is a chess book stop me from being a novelist. Okay? Right. So I, I wrote my books as if they're novels. Like, I mean, I just, I, um, I mean, it drives critics crazy. You know, one one of my critics uh, called my style uh, "Black Dewall a stream of consciousness fluff." You know, <laughs> <laughs> ouch, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> I actually, I, I I'm actually like amused by the the critics sometimes. But um, another one, um, another one trashed one of my books. Um, like three days before it won uh, Instructional Book of the Year Award by the American Chess Journalist. I love when that happens, when <laughs> the critic gets egg all over his face. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean... See, the thing, I don't write for them, I write for my readers. I, right. I, I understand that there's a portion of the chess public that dislikes my style, finds it annoying. That's fine, you know, I no offense, I don't 
I have no problem with you. I, some of these guys are my friends on Facebook. I, I, I have no problem with that. Right. Um, but don't take a dump on my books, assuming that every single human being in the world dislikes them. Some people actually like them. You know, a lot of... It, it, I, I get a lot of contracts from publishers. They don't do that unless your books sell. Right, and right. And the reason they sell is people don't want to read a chess book as if they're looking at the New York Stock Exchange, you know, ticker tape. But like, they don't want just data. They they want they want some color and life in the books. Right, and, uh, right. Yeah, that and that's know, anything, that's the amazing thing that I think is really unique about about your writing. What about chess books in general, like physical chess books? Why, why in the the you know the chessable age, the modern age of of internet books and things like that? Why are physical books still popular? Why do you think you still sell? I guess uh, I don't know. I I mean I keep saying they're dying, but my my physical books still outsell my eBooks. I don't mm. get it. I. Maybe there's a lot of old guys out there. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know I just want the book itself. You know, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I keep thinking it's like you know, it, it's like the horse and buggy guy. Uh, you know, raising a fist at the <laughs> yeah. the, the yeah. newfangled automobile. They'll never last. The horse and buggy is real. That's just a contraption. <laughs> no, it's like you know. It, there were bookstores a while back, you know, 20 years ago, there were bookstores everywhere. I, I, one of my favorite things to do when, if my wife and I go on vacation is I would check up, check out every used bookstore in the city and look for chess books and weird sci-fi and weird books that I'm, you know, rare books that I'm looking for. Um, it's no fun now. It's like they're all gone. And any book I want, I can instantly order. And so, where's the like? What's the point of right. to, like searching out the used bookstore when I can instantly order it on a Kindle? I can change the font to make it gigantic for my old eyes. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I need more brightness. No problem. Right. Boom! I think it's brighter now. Uh, you can't stop technology. It's like uh, I keep hearing about nuclear disarmament. It's it's an eighty year old technology, not like you know ninety year old technology, right? Like right. How on earth are we going to stop it from? Uh, people are going to get it if they right. want it. They're going to get it. So right. it's 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 kind of like that. You can't when some when science invents something, it you can't put the toothpaste back in that tube. It's it's right. once it's out, it's out. You know, and so uh, I think books. They, they will always be around, but they're they're dying with the younger kids. I mean, the younger kids always want the ebooks or the chessable or the you know. I'm I'm resisting right now, but uh, I can't. I'm just the horse and buggy driver. I know that. You know, it's like I know that books are going away. It's just I I grew up in a world where I, I love them. And so I'm sticking with them, you know. Yeah, that's fantastic. That far from retirement, probably, you know. So it's like, it, it's not going to affect me that book book sales are going down. Part of it too is it's not just books that are getting less popular. It's just there's so much free content on the internet. Yeah. Like I put out, I mean. If you're like my Facebook friend, you never need to buy a chess book again, right? I mean, I, I put out so much content. Don't tell like, them the secrets. A, no, I know, I know. I, it's, but, you know, I, here, yeah. here's a main two puzzle. Here's a, you know, here's right. an end game study. This game was in this book, and here it is. You know, so it's like, uh, but there's tons of free stuff on YouTube. You could watch. YouTube videos till the end of time and you won't finish, you know? I mean, right. I mean, how many hundreds of videos are added each day? It's just, it, it's exponential, right? So, yeah, that's true. Um, so it's, it's more like for people want the book itself, like a collector. They want it, they want it on their shelf. Mm -hmm. They want to have a set of chess books. It's not that they, you know, you could download my my PDF and steal my book if you want, you know, right? Right. I mean, 
any book that I write within three days, uh, you know, here's the uh, if you here's the PDF for all the criminals out there. Please, <laughs> go ahead, steal Cyrus like to all his books. <laughs> here it is, right here for you. <laughs> yeah, they'll at least be good at chess. Um, <laughs> okay, so yeah, I want to I want to transition a little bit into talking about we we're kind of talking about it a little bit. Um, but I want to fill, first fill in the gaps about your your uh, development as a chess player. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like it came after you were already a syndicated columnist, um, and then you you got no. serious about chess. Is that true or no? No, I by that time in my early twenties, I was about twenty five hundred years. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. I, I, I had another jump later in my early 30s to almost 2,600. Right. But, uh, no, I was a spectacularly uh, untalented kid. I mean, I, like, I mean, I was, you know, like uh, in the bottom five percentile probably. Oh, know, wow. For, for talent level. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I remember my very first tournament was the 1973 uh, Canadian Open. And I remember some other kid asked me my rating. I said, I'm unrated, but I estimate my rating somewhere around 2,000. <laughs> first, rating, <laughs> first rating at age uh, almost 13, uh, 1150. Oh, crap. Could I have overestimated my ability? Right, you right. Know? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, no, no quantum jump uh, by age 17, 1795. You know? Well, yeah, that that's that that surprised me actually. That but you're only 1795 because right. the the mo the modern prodigies and strong players. Right, well, right. I, it's it's they're all grandmasters by then. So well, I mean, uh, I a student of mine, uh, he won the um, A through sixth grade. Uh, championship last year you know he, his name is isaac um he he was a master at 12 i've, I've taught many kids now who mm -hmm. make master at 12 they almost always become like ims you know and, right uh this this one might be a gm you know but um but uh yeah it's completely different i mean just think uh of the tools they have that my generation didn't have i i I went from books. I was like a, in a. Um, it, it was like a famine, an information famine, you know, in chess. Like I, I was desperate for books. And if you go to the library, it's like, oh no, the stupid beginner's book that's totally useless to me. You know, like a, <laughs> yeah. all like you know, oh gee, this is how the knight moves. Like no, god damn it, I don't want to. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Sorry. You might, you might just need to edit that out. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, like, no, no, please, not the freaking beginner's books. And, like, you know, if I go to tournaments, you know, there were books there, and there was the other problem of my cheapskate father giving me 25 cents a, a week allowance. Well, like, really? Like, I, and, and the chess book would cost, like, you know, uh, $3. Like, oh, my God, that, that's a long, that's three months savings. You know, to, I, would, I would be mowing lawns to earn those 50 cents or 25 cents to mow the guy's lawn. And just keep, you know, piling up my massive cash store until I could buy a book. Right, know? right. But, uh, it was just a different era, you know, like, I would get Canadian chess chat. And you know, I, I would wait for it every month, and it was, it was not even as, I mean, rank and file was like a million times better than Canadian chess chat, you know. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, you yeah, you grew up in um, Montreal. Canada, Montreal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And, so so the information ecosystem hadn't even hardly developed in Canada no, at the no. time. No, I mean it was the seventies, early seventies. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. And it was like an all the chess was downtown, you know. So I would have to, I, I lived, you know, in the suburbs, like I, like, why, why didn't I live in the ghetto where I could be downtown? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was in the suburbs, you know, like that meant I, I would have to walk uh, like two miles to the shopping center, 
then take like this 45 minute bus ride to the metro station which is a sub subway yeah and then take another 15 20 minutes on the subway the metro and then walk a little and then get to the uh you know the en passant chess club or the alakin chess club where all the top players were that's where i was hungry to be you know and mm. uh not that I was a prodigy or anything, but I could beat the kids at school usually, you know, right. they, they weren't like, you know, they were all like, you know, 1000s and I was like the, the towering giant 1300, you know, like out of my way, little man, you know, I'm the 1300, do you know who I am? I'm the 1300. <laughs> That's great. Oh man. So, but you describe yourself as, as not having any real natural talent. Um, I mean, obviously, that's probably an understatement. But when did you realize that you could you could play really strong competitive chess? I, I, um, I realized something at age seventeen, mm. uh, like when I was in that twenty, uh, you know, that seventeen ninety five zone. I started training in chess seriously for the first time, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I just started having exponential jumps, one after another, one after another. By by age, uh, I guess like uh, by age twenty, I was I I'd moved to the U.S. at eight on my eighteenth birthday. We crossed the border, you know, and went to the U.S. Um, but by age, uh, my first U.S. rating was like only something like about a hundred points higher, eighteen ninety five. It wasn't spectacular but then at 20 uh it was like i suddenly jumped to 2197 oh wow and was stuck there stuck there for maybe a year and then uh i it's like i was never between 2200 and 2300 i, I just suddenly went to like 2350 from 2197 wow. i was trapped there for a year and then i just suddenly jumped to about 2350 and then I very quickly hit 2,500, low 2,500s, like 2,530. Yeah. And I was stuck there for probably, uh, you know, uh, 10 years. Wow. You know, nine years. And then I had another jump to my final one to like uh, 2,597 was the high. But for about the next 30 years, I, uh, I was over 2,500. You know, like wow. I, I, I didn't go below 2550 for decades, you know, just like two decades. I was over 2550. Do you blame so that on the like, London system? <laughs> no, the London system was the, the cause of the jump. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Do you blame well, that, I, the jump on the London system? Yeah. 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 I, uh, I don't blame. I praise the London <laughs> system. For it. Yeah. But, um, I, I recently wrote, uh, this is a book I did not want to write. I was like, they want an autobiography. That's like saying, you know, like, uh, you know, you want an autobiography of the guy who's like the accountant who lives with his mother. <laughs> and, you know, it, like, it, you know, uh, chapter two, uh, I really like tuna fish sandwiches for lunch. You know that, like, really, you want my autobiography? <laughs> like, I, what, what the hell did I do? You know, it's like, well, you gained a cult following, <laughs> is what you did. But <laughs> I have a cult. I have a cult following, but they think I climbed climb Mount Everest. No, I, I just watched those on TV. I didn't climb Mount Everest. Oh, okay, like, okay. That's chapter three. I watched someone climb Mount Everest. You know. Right. So what I, what I did was, and then the. The publisher said, yeah, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And I go, I go oh, my God, you've got to be joking. You know, like, I, you know, the dullest life in human history, and, and people <laughs> want to read about it. Like, uh, you know, you know, I, I like tea in the morning, and sometimes I add soy milk in it, or but then I don't like the estrogen, so I switch to oat milk. And, like, you know, people are not going to want to buy that book, I told them. But, um... So what I did was I turned it into my training methods. I realized that I do have a gift in chess, but it's not it's not in playing, it's in training. Mm. My father was a wannabe Olympic athlete. He missed um, he missed by one place making it to the Olympics. Wow. In, in swimming. 
and he knew how to train, and he taught me how to train. And at age 17, I decided, um, uh, you know, what would be really cool is if I became a, like a professional chess player. Uh, you're 1795 at age 17. That's a really, really bad idea, dude. You know, my mind didn't say that. It should have, but it, but it didn't say that. And I said, I'm just going to train as if I'm training for the Olympics. Right. And I created this training program. That is what my book is about, this coming book. It's called, um, the, the, I wanted to call it B player to I am, but they told me nobody in Europe knows what a B player is, so they're calling it becoming an I am. Okay. Um, but it's really my, my autobiography. And it's a strange autobiography in that I, uh, I put some of my most hideous humiliations in the book uh, because I want it to be real. I don't want this to be a, a superhero story because that's not how chess works. Right. Chess right. works uh, with uh, Dostoevsky like suffering, you know, where. Uh, the vast majority, uh, you know, hang themselves on page 800 in, in, in real life chess stories, right? Like right. A, just like a Dostoevsky character commits suicide on page 800, you know, that's what most of us go through. So that's what I wanted to put in the struggle, you know. Uh -huh. I couldn't put Mein Kampf as the title, you know, that would yeah. be wrong. You know, right, so right. Struggle. But, uh, but that would have been the perfect, uh, you know, the perfect name for the book, My Struggle, except Hitler uh, used that. Yeah, he ruined time. that one so forever, he, but... Uh, <laughs> he ruined it for everybody. You know? Yeah, and so, swastikas. He ruined those, too. But <laughs> He actually did, believe it or not, I grew up Zoroastrian, and uh, I'm Buddhist now, but I grew up Zoroastrian, and uh, on our temples, they have swastikas everywhere. Right. And then I switched to another religion, Buddhism, which has swastikas on the Buddha's feet. They have swastikas, you know. Right, because they were he, symbols of like, peace. It, yeah, it, it was a it was a religious symbol. He just right. swiped, you know, from yeah. a, like. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> it's sad, but anyway, um, I want to I want to hear about your your um, uh, experience as a coach because one one of the big parts of this project, United States of Chess, is covering some of the top talent in the U.S. and you know. I've spoken to uh, Christopher Yu and uh, Abhimanyu Mishra, mm -hmm. and they've both said they want to be world champion, right? And right. Right. and that's just such a such a monumental challenge to go through. Right. You know, you became an right. IM after being a, a 17, 17 year old um, right. uh, mid mid level uh, amateur. <laughs> like a club level, just right. a guy at the club. I right. <laughs> But the next leap to uh, you know super grandmaster and and world right. champion that takes right. just so much um, time and effort. Um, first right. question though with that is why do you mm -hmm. think the United States hasn't um, achieved a world champion since Bobby Fischer? Um, it might you know Fabi Caruana could be the next world champion. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, world champion. Uh, is not something um, you could work for. You have to have an insane amount of talent. Um, you can be a lazy world champion, like uh, they say Spassky, Capablanca, and Carlson are all pretty lazy, okay, for, <laughs> for their level, right? Uh, Carlson could easily have been the greatest player of all time. I'm writing a book right now called The Greatest Question Mark. Right, and I uh, I have Kasparov as the greatest of all time, and I have I have Carlson at number two. Oh, and I downgraded I downgraded him to number two because Kasparov outworked him. Kasparov right. had that uh, unique quality of immense talent and immense work ethic. Right, and with that combination, it's just explosive. Mm -hmm. You know that that leads to. A dominant world champion. Carlson was a dominant world champion in being lazy, and so was Capablanca. You know, I mean, I, I, and another guy that wasn't better that won a world championship match was Alekin. Alekin was not better than Capa in 27. Right, right. <clears throat> he just worked harder, and Capablanca would go to nightclubs and, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, 
screw around and not look at adjourn positions. And, right. You know, that's not the... He, he Paramount has one uh, downfall in that it naturally leads to um, overconfidence. You, you tend to inflate your power when you're talented. You just... I, I can get there, you know, I nobody can stop me, that, that kind of attitude. Um, like, for instance, it's impossible to pick <clears throat> out of the group of prodigies who's going to be world champion. Right? For instance, Nepo was probably a better shot at being world champion than Carlson, but Carlson turned out to be the, the superior player. I wrote books on both, you know, I mean, right. it, but Nepo is a great player, but... Um, He's he's in grave danger of uh, Bogolyubovhood, you know, where you you keep challenging and losing for the world t t title, or Taroshhood, or you know, like uh, Dunowskihood, you know, where you're you're banging your head against Lasker, and I'm sorry, Lasker just swats you away yeah, and beats yeah. you. But, you know, you're this great player, except for that one guy. Right, he just keeps bashing your head in in the matches, you know, like, right. but so, um, these are, I mean, I can't feel all that sorry for them since, you know, like I'm not playing for the world championship. I think you're a pretty good player. If you're right. I, I love, I love this. Uh, uh, I just finished a book I'm working on with, uh, Karsten Hansen on Ding Liren. Um, and, uh, I, I love these uh, Ding and Nepo are crap uh, like posts on, on social media. <laughs> really? They were at the time numbers two and three in the world. There is no number two and three in the world, by the way. It changes on a daily yeah, basis. Yeah, yeah, on numbers. a daily basis, like, yeah. Oh, 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 Fabi is now number two in the world. Wait, Nakamura is number yeah, two in the yeah. world. Wait, Ali Reza is. That like, happened this week, like, yeah. Who? Just this week, They're yeah. They're like within yeah. one point of each other, and it, when one beats the other, they jump to number two, and then they get beaten, and then oh, the other guy's back over. You yeah. Know, there's no number two in the world. It's it's like this massive tie from two to ten. And right. There's Magnus, who's just in his own category. Although right now, he's limping along because of his, uh, you know, like I'm bored with chess, and uh, I'm, you know, I, I want to be a poker star. Yeah, and Michael Jordan was a great baseball player too. Everybody says that. <laughs> like, like, no, dude. Yeah. Your, your ability is chess. Play chess. <laughs> Stop screwing around with poker. So Michael Jordan. But with, nobody ever says that Michael Jordan. What a baseball player he was. You know? But with like, Carlson out of the picture, it does give the U.S. players some more hope. And I, I want to yeah, talk yeah, about sure. the two. I think it's there's just two echelons or just two generations of players right now. You have mm -hmm, you have sure. Fabiano, Wesley, and and even Aronian, who still right. kind of has a shot, um, and right. he's now an American player. He's he's part of the right. American Federation. Right. Um, uh -huh. So if he wins, I think that would kind of be considered a, <laughs> an American World Champion. Right. Um, sure. uh, it's a borderline thing, but so there's there's it's that generation, and even even Neiman, you can kind of put Neiman in that. He's kind of in, in between yeah. the two generations, I but I. No. No, okay. No. Neiman is Neiman is not like a, you know, he's like below 2700 and yeah. I, Neiman Neiman I, I don't think he's going to be the world champion. I okay. that one I I I'm you know, I will bet you uh, you know, my $1 to your one penny. <laughs> <laughs> wow, 100 to 1. I like that. That's, 100 to 1. That's right. a, good, a good chance. I, I can tell I can tell when someone's going to be a world champion yeah. like has a shot. Right. And all the players you mentioned have a shot. Right. Okay, without Magnus. If Magnus comes back, you have to wait till Magnus is like, you know, in his 90s or something. He's just in a, on a, on his own level. You right. Know, if, he, if he actually starts... You know, if he says to himself, you know, I'm going to stop drinking a gallon of alcohol every day and stop right. playing poker, maybe I'll, you know, win the world. If he wanted to, he could be world champion again. Right. Easily. I, right. You know. But, I, I but mean, let, let's assume he stays out. Let's assume he stays out. And okay. and Fabi, Wesley, and, and Aronian have, have a good shot. 
Um, but also Hikaru, you have to. Oh, have and Hikaru. Hikaru. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize for not putting Hikaru in there. He he's certainly in there, yeah. and he's proved that he's world class. Right. Um, right. So he those was four two in the world for a full day. Right. I mean, he was. It was like for one day, and he <laughs> lost. Oh, I'm not number two now. <laughs> so so is there anybody missing first in that in that generation? That has a no, shot from from the U.S. From, from the U.S., I think you've got it. It's Aronian, So, uh, Fabi, and Hikaru. I, I would say. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I I can't think of another. And how long do you case. think they have to achieve world championship? Not long. Not long. They're all like in their thirties. I think. Right. I don't know how old Wesley so is, but I think he's in his. Wesley's he, just he, a year or two younger than Fabi, so yeah. Okay. So he's but in his thirties as well. They've got probably like uh, four to five years, all of them. And then they're going to wow. start declining. Four to five years, you think? That. Yeah, I mean, I mean, now, now four to five years. In the old days, it used to be longer. They yeah. could play till maybe thirty-nine, but not not anymore. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, Vish, Vishy did right. So, <clears throat> and Vishy's still playing. Vishy is a. Is an anomaly. He's right. a, he's like a Smyslov or a Lasker, uh, you know, where or Korchnoi, you know, where he's got the longevity thing going. Right. You know, right. I mean, he's a complete anomaly. And Gelfand. I mean, he doesn't play. To, yeah. I mean, he might be grossly overrated because he doesn't play very much right now. Right. Right. You know, That's and true. you could keep like I retired in uh, 2019 from tournament chess. Am I? Am I a twenty four ninety two player right now? I doubt it. Right. That's what I'll be because I don't play. Right? right. So if you don't play, you you become overrated. That's true. You know. So, so uh, okay. So if if this <clears throat> this current generation that's really on the top at the moment in the top ten, and mm -hmm. they're fighting vying for the world championship, <clears throat> if, mm -hmm. if they don't do it in four to five years, maybe six. It, that's three cycles, right? Um, the current right. cycles of two years cycles. Right, I would say three cycles they have. Yeah, max. So, so then, so then you have the second, the next generation coming up, which, which is all the Indians, the, all the Indian players, right. Christopher Yu and uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but uh, Abhi, Abhimanyu Mishra. Mishra. Or, oh my or, God, these the, yeah, these oh, bloody Indians. These they call him Abhi. They call him Abhi. Abhimanyu Mishra. <laughs> Why can't they shorten, they truncate their name? Why can't I be loved? Well, well, well. He's just Abby. I, I'm, Abby trying Abby. I'm trying to do Abby. I'm trying to. I'm trying to educate the world that Abby is the way to go. Okay, I'm gonna call him Abby, and I'm lack too. I, they, these Indians lack. are All right. troublemakers. They're horrible troublemakers. You know? <laughs> these ridiculously long names, Lactawala. I mean, yeah. So actually, I, I have an interesting scoop on on Abby. Because I mm -hmm. feel that Abi hasn't gotten the press attention in America like he should be getting. Is that mm -hmm. because of his Indian heritage? Um, is there is there something else? It maybe even just the media landscape being so crowded. Um, um, I think that's it. I think it's just like oh, yes, another you know uh, six year old GM. You know, in preschool or five-year-old GM, it's like ah! you know, the, it's like we're we're completely uh, immunized to to you know, like uh, little Sammy Rushevsky is playing all these people, and he's ten years old. Right well, now, they're like people that are like GM strength that are in that range. You know, it's like we're we're we, we've got the they're like this army of. Uh, genetically enhanced uh, super soldiers, you know, <laughs> that we didn't have in the past, right? Right. And so, we, you, you know, at first, like, oh, my God, this genetically enhanced super soldier, he's an IM by age 13. Right. And now it's like, wow, you're only an IM and you're 13? You're not ever going to be world champion, dude. You know, like, yeah. so it's like, yeah, we, right. we just expect more and more and right. more. And I think that's the reason Abby is not getting um, the press attention he deserves. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, to break... Plus to is, how, his long name. <laughs> well, for, first, <laughs> let's let's break down how, how hard it is to break the, the youngest grandmaster... Um, record 
I mean, he did it. He did it with a few months to spare, and he did it through COVID, right. which he probably lost right. a solid right. nine months right. to a year. Exactly. That slowed a lot of my students down. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. No. No. I mean, he's uh, obviously anyone who breaks that record is automatically a candidate for future world champion. Right. Anyone right. who breaks that record, and right. I think Christopher Yu too was slowed down by COVID. Right. You know, I think he would have been a GM way before he was. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I featured some of his. I'm very impressed with Christopher Yu. Uh, I, I've seen some of his uh, Endgame studies. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's like he learned <clears throat> about composing. And then eight months later, he won a prize in a composing competition. Uh, to me, that's like, uh, you know, that's like a guy learning how to play chess. And then eight months later, yeah, I just got my final GM norm and I'm, <laughs> My rating is twenty four ninety nine. I just need that one point, and then I'm a GM. You know? Right. You you won a competition eight months after learning. I mean, I I have a page on Facebook called uh, Chess Endgame Studies and Compositions that I started with GM Max Illingworth, and uh, these composers. I mean, um, I don't know if you ever saw that. Uh, 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 original Star Trek. You're probably too young to have seen original. I have Star seen Trek. all of them. Yes. <laughs> but, but the, the, the first episode, uh, you know, the 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 menagerie where you have these aliens where they're 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 scrawny little bodies with the gigantic heads and they're all like clairvoyant. Those are the composers. Okay, those are like they're they're super intellects. Like these these composers on my page. Every time I talk to them, I I feel mentally challenged. <laughs> you know, like when I discuss any chess position, you know, they, yeah. they know so much. It's un, like way more than chess players about theory, like endgame theory. Right. And, you know, oh, two knights can't mate except in this position. But this is the exception with that one pawn here. And, the, you know, they know everything about everything. Um, and they're creative geniuses. I think it's like another form of trust that's grossly uh, undervalued. And yeah. uh, I, I think it's actually a phenomenal learning tool on top of that. I've had uh, explosive jumps in uh, students that have been just trapped at one rating for decades that uh, had exponential jumps from doing these endgame studies. And mating, mating two problems are extremely valuable too. I think right the composed names into they're not the same as puzzles you know yeah in, anyway he uh, his endgame studies were amazing I uh, I tried to solve some of them sad it was it was a sad experience I, <laughs> <laughs> I worked on it for like hours and hours and I could I, I was like inching my way forward like I was like that soldier you know in in the like crawling in the mud, like, uh, where, like, my my gun is on my back and my, um, I have a knife in my teeth, and I'm crawling closer and closer to the machine gun nest right. in World War One, and I want to plunge that knife into the, into the back of the machine gunner, you know, yeah. it's like, I, that's how I felt when trying to solve it, and I just, I, I gave up, you know, I, it was too difficult, but they, they, they blew my mind, I mean, this right. guy's like a world-class He's like a world class, uh, y you know, endgame composer at like age, what, 13 at the time? It was like, yeah. what the hell, you know? I think he could be one of the greatest of all time if he oh, focused wow. on that. But of course, he's not going to because nobody gives a damn about composition, right? They want to all be over the board players and world champions. You know? Right, right. Yeah, that, but that it, is more attractive to people. Yeah. Anyone with that gift, mm -hmm. okay, with that gift that can create stuff like that, I, I think has a shot. Yeah, that's, a, that's an unexpected answer for me. <laughs> the fact that he's such a strong composer, I wouldn't have expected that as, as part of the, the calculation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's move on from Christopher. Um, who else do we have in the landscape that has a shot? Um, you never know. People have jumps, you know, they have crazy mm -hmm. jumps where like, uh, like I said, 
Magnus did not look like he was going to outstrip Nepo, at least not dominate Nepo. Right. You know, like dominantly ahead of Nepo. But Nepo was the more gifted, naturally gifted player. Mm -hmm. And Magnus is the lazier player on top of it. So how the hell did he, he just, something clicked. It, it's just like a, something clicks and suddenly you get it and you're, and you're better. That happened to me like, um, you know, about four or five times in my, chess where <clears throat> like people think it's like all it's very incremental i'm gonna gain 50 points a year and be a great player it doesn't work that way you're just stuck for three years and then you gain 200 points you know that that's the way it works i think that points to something that that the non-chess player wouldn't really understand which is the psychology of of your play um, is that is that mostly psychological? Do you think, or is it just a combination? I, I don't really understand the question. What do you mean? The well, the, 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 the those, those jumps theory. are. It seems like you know you might have all of the the technical skill and the and the ability, mm, but it, is is it a psychological block that's holding back these players? No, no, no. I don't think so. I think it's like a. A missing piece of a puzzle and it as soon as that last piece clicks in it's like this light goes on you know so then it, it's the, a, the accumu on. accumulation of knowledge then <clears throat> it it's an accumulation of knowledge it, it's it's a it's garbled data and all of a sudden you understand the data it's like something clicks and you oh you know like i i get it now and like you're your your understanding just jumps. Right. It's like you you keep accumulating data, but but somehow it's not applied in your chess, and something mm. clicks and suddenly you can apply it now. That's what it is. So you're telling but me it's probably it's sleep then. <laughs> <laughs> it's your subconscious mind working it out. <laughs> well, uh, believe it or not, sleep is one of the most uh, critical aspects of chess, and that goes with uh, ang performance anxiety. Not the kind you need Viagra for, but the other kind of <laughs> chess terms, okay? With, like, you know, right. You can edit this out, too. <laughs> it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. My, you know, it's funny. When I first uh, started writing, like, my my editors were, like, horrified, like, ah, oh, you can't put that in a book. You can't put that in a book. Now, no problem. I put some <laughs> totally tasteless joke in a book. Yeah, oh, nothing yeah. is too shocking. Your, your your audience, no problem. Your audience actually expects you to be tasteless, Cyrus. So we're putting it in. <laughs> you know. In fact, we were a little bit disappointed. Your last book didn't have any tasteless jokes. So right. Know. Anyway, uh, it, you know, performance anxiety is a major, major issue for. Uh, I would say. Uh, anyone who's ambitious, okay. Right. Um, <clears throat> the way I dealt with it was meditation, okay. I, I had to, um, because when you have performance anxiety, what happens is you sleep like a baby every night except before the chess tournament. Boom, you can't sleep. And you go in sleep deprived and you play 400 points below your actual strength. Right. And it happens to a lot of people. And <clears throat> the secret cure is you must realize that um, you, you are in control of how you react to the world. Like you, like you can lose that game and you could throw a hissy fit or you could say, well, sometimes people lose, you know, and you can accept it. And, or you can crave the results so much you, I, I want this. I must win that game to get that norm. That's that's a that's a tough night to sleep. Right. You, you know you got to beat this guy the next day, okay? And you can you can take the uh, drug route, and then you're drugged up, and you play like an ass. You know you 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 play like a you know a cottony fuzzy headed guy. Right. So the drugs don't really help, except unless. They're, if it's a night game, you know, but <clears throat> uh, but what you've got to do is you've got to realize you are not in control. Okay, you are not in control of your fate. You can you're in control of how you train, 
you're in control of how how hard you work, how hard you work at the board, your intensity at the board, right. all that you can control. You cannot control the result. Okay. Yeah. Geometric anomalies crop up. The other guy's having a, uh, you know, uh, try playing after having a fight with girlfriend or wife. I mean, forget it. You're you're done for. You know, like you're you're, you're doomed if you're, you know. Dylan, I've had it with your chess. Okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, when you come back from the chess tournament, we'll talk about this more. Okay, now go to your chess right. tournament. Right. Okay, Dylan goes 0 and 6, you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, Cyrus. We, we should we should wrap up now because I know we have to go in a few minutes. Um, okay. Bef before we do, is there anybody anywhere you want to direct people um, to that they can find your work, um, your website, or... Uh, I don't have a website. I mean, you can get my books from uh, just Amazon okay. or uh, Everyman uh, site, uh, New and Chess site, but just Amazon. Great. Karsten Hansen and I are writing uh, books together. You know, I mean, we, uh, it, it, it's like they don't get advertised, so the numbers are lower, but there's no publisher. I, I mean, Amazon takes much less of a cut than the publisher does so it's a it's a mix you know i mean you, yeah i like working for the publisher and on my own right you know, so that's awesome well thanks again for joining me today well, and thank you um, so much for inviting me yeah 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 i mean we could keep talking for hours so maybe we'll have we'll do this again sometime <laughs> soon